a national children's disciple making specialist with the Alliance. Yes. Tell me I nailed that. You nailed it. You nailed yes. it. All right. I'm shocked. Good job. All right. Well, join me. Let's welcome Miss McDonald. Well, good morning, church. How are you? I don't often get to speak where I have to like turn like this, so this is fun. I'm glad to see all you. We're so excited to be here this morning. I travel a lot, so this morning was so nice to uh, wake up in our bed and just drive on over. So that feels like a luxury to us. Uh, and we love coming to Fremont. We do love Rivercrest, and we love you guys and love who you are as a church. So it's just an honor for us to be here and be able to hopefully encourage you and inspire you just a little bit this morning, but most importantly, talk to you about who Jesus is, because that's really who matters the most. So I am here with my husband, Luis. We've been married a whole, how many? 17 months, you guys. So we're booking marriage conferences because we have it all figured out now. So um, let us know. We are so good at the marriage thing. Actually, it's really hard. Did you guys know marriage is hard? That nobody warned us about that. Uh, actually, we were totally warned, but you know, you're in love and you think it's going to be precious. And it is. And then it's not all the time precious. So <clears throat> Today's not one of those times. We're having a good time. So anyways, I want to talk to you a little bit about Christ for the next generation. I am passionate about kids, but I'm mostly passionate about people. I'm passionate about what God desires to do through people and in people, and I love the local church. I love, love, love the local church. I'm one of those weird millennials who is still in the local church. I'm one of those who believes that God still desires to work in the local church. And we do live in Red Oak, Iowa. My dad's the Alliance pastor there. And we just finished up VBS. I led VBS all week and I still have a little bit of a VBS hangover. Um, so I'm a little bit tired and my voice is a little bit rough. And I figured you guys would be okay with that because you understand VBS, right? Okay. Did anyone else have a VBS hangover after your VBS? Let's see. Yes. Okay. Some of you just lying. That's all. Um, <clears throat> But I love what God is doing in the local church. One of the things I'm really passionate about is understanding why we're losing a lot of people out of our churches. How many of you have watched somebody that you've loved or prayed for or taught walk away from the church at some point? Raise your hand. It's going to be interactive morning, okay? Good job. I, I'm not saying good job because they walked away. I'm just saying good job for raising your hands. Sad, right? Isn't that one of, I think, the hardest things? For some of you, when I ask that, it's really personal because it's somebody, maybe it's your own child or your grandchild or, or somebody that you really mentored. And so I, I'm always thinking about how do we not have that happen again? What do we, what do, we do with that? And so one of, one of the things, I did a bunch of research, and a lot of our millennials have walked away from the church. And, and one of the things they'll say, and you can go to that slide, is they'll say, I didn't feel like I belonged. So they left the church because they didn't feel like they belonged. Now, I get a little frustrated with stuff like that because I don't really like that phrase that perception is reality because that annoys me. Um, but the reality is that's true. And so a lot of our millennials have walked away saying, I just didn't feel like I belonged. And one of the things I believe God desires the church to be is a place where everybody belongs. Do you agree with that? where everybody belongs. Just got done leading our VBS and a mom came up to me and she has three kids and they are just those kids. You know, the ones that you're like, oh heavens, wow. Um, it just, they don't understand rhetorical questions. They don't understand quiet. And so, you know, got a hundred kids and they're the ones who are, I have something to say. I, you know, okay, okay. And so, well, one of them is um, autistic. And the mom told me, she goes, we got kicked out of our last church. And she said, because they didn't know what to do with Cammie. Well, Cammie's eight. <laughs> she's a lot, but she's still a part of the kingdom of God. And she goes, we, we have yet to find a church like this where we're welcome. And I said, oh, you are completely welcome. In fact, we like mess. We like that she's a little bit out there. She'll fit in real well here. And you know what? I think that's what our church communities are meant to be, a place where everybody belongs. Because isn't that what Christ's heart was and is? He didn't die for the cleaned up. <laughs> he didn't die for the, for the perfect. He didn't die for those that look like they have it all together. <clears throat> he died for the lost. He died for you and me. And I don't know about you, I don't have it all together very often. And so I love that idea of 
promoting the body of Christ in a way that I think is healthy, where everybody belongs, warts and all, warts and all. I go into some churches where they'll prepare me, like, hey, we are, uh, we, we just, we have some special people. And I'm like, perfect, I'll fit in great. And I've had everything happen. I had one, one man, he had some special needs. He just came up and stood by me while I preached one morning. And we just kept going. It was not a problem. And we, I love when I go into churches where it's just a little bit messy. And I haven't been here long enough to tell if you're messy. But I have a feeling there's some mess in the room. Am I right about this? Okay, good. I see some of you are like, oh, thank goodness. Yes, yeah, she, she sees. So let's pray real quick as we just enter into this. Um, make sure our hearts are in the right spot. Father, we don't want to miss what you have to show us this morning. God, I don't want this just to be another, another sermon, another stop on a Sunday morning. Would you meet us here as you already have? Would you speak to us? In your name we pray. Amen. So when we think about reaching the next generation, I like to look at two things, and you can click to the next slide. The two things here, first of all, home and church. Home is really important. And here's what's hard, because in our culture today, we don't have a lot of safe homes. We don't have a lot of homes where um, it's healthy, <laughs> where kids are being raised up in a place that is healthy. And this is the beautiful thing about the church, because God designed the church to be family. He designed us to love people right where they're at. And so the important thing is, when we think about families, we have to think about home, but we also have to think about church. And the church body should be family. It should be family. This should be a place where everyone feels like they belong, everyone feels safe, everybody knows that they're important. And so we want to think about home, but we also want to understand the importance of church. I'm going to look at Deuteronomy 6 real quickly. And this is a really common passage that we go to, Deuteronomy 6, 4. And we go to this a lot when we're trying to tell parents what to do. Now, I am not a parent because we just got married. Don't rush us, okay? And so I don't have that going on yet. But we use this a lot to tell parents what they're doing wrong. And I, this is really interesting because this is not actually <laughs> directed at parents. So it says, listen, O Israel, and I'm reading out the New Living Translation. The Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I am giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home, when you are on the road, when you're going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands, wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Often we're telling parents, this is what you need to be doing. But here's what's interesting. If you look at who the audience is, it actually says, listen, O Israel, or hear, O Israel, which is not hear, O parents. It's a call to the community of faith. And the Israel community was being told, hey, we do this together. So here's the deal. You might be sitting here today and going, I don't really like kids. And I'm going to tell you, that is okay. And can I please tell you something that it might be a little hard to hear? If you don't like kids, please do not sign up to work with the children's ministry, okay? Everybody just take a deep breath if you don't like kids. Don't feel like you need to volunteer for you. We don't want you, actually. And it's not, it's not because you're not a great person, but it's because God's gifted you in an area that doesn't need to be kids. <clears throat> and that's an okay thing. But here's the deal. Every single one of us has a responsibility to pass on faith to the next generation. And that does not mean necessarily that you volunteer to work with Awana. But the way you live your life passes on faith. The way you do the job that you have passes on faith. When people pass you in the grocery store, you pass on faith. When you serve here at the church, you might be the best usher this church has ever seen, and that's a gifting God has given you. Do that as if working for the Lord, because you are, and that passes on faith. But all of us have a responsibility. This isn't just to the parents. This is to all of us. The other place that I want to look is in Psalm 78. And Psalm 78 is one of my favorite verses, or psalms. And it says, um, I'm going to start here at verse, uh, I think I'll start at one. Oh, my people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past. Stories we have heard and known. Stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation. 
about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about the power and his mighty wonders. And it goes on to say in verse six, so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born, and they in turn will teach their own children. Verse seven, so each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. It goes on to talk about the people who forgot what God did. And I always think, how do you forget what God did? But you know how you forget? When you forget to tell the story of what God's done. When's the last time you shared your story of how God's been at work in your life? When's the last time you parents told your kids how you came to know Jesus? I had a kid in my home church in Iowa. She came up to me. Her dad is an elder in our church. And she said, Miss Mel, I'm pretty sure my dad doesn't know Jesus. And I was like, well, hmm. Like, I'm like 100% sure he does. And I said, well, what makes you think that? She goes, well, he's never told me. And I thought, boy, isn't that interesting? She was going, he's never told me. When is the last time you told your story? You told what God's done. That is how we pass on faith to the next generation. If God has been at work in your life, you need to tell somebody. And may I also say this, if you love Jesus and God's been at work in your life, could you tell your face about it? Let that settle in for a minute. It's okay to smile. It's okay to have joy. Christians are not called to be the most depressed people on the earth. And we all meet people like that. How you doing today? Well, I'm just getting by. Okay. Or my favorite is the man who told me, every day is a battle. I'm like, you're depressing. (laughs) I was like, but you do know that we get to win, right? Like we get to win. Us and Jesus. So let your face in on it. Do you know that just having joy passes on faith to the next generation? Because they go, wait a minute, there's something different. There's something different. Do you know what your attitude can pass on faith? It's amazing to me the conversations that get started just from people smiling when everybody else is cranky. That's, we pass on faith. So Psalm 78 is talking about don't be like the other people who forgot. They forgot because nobody told. May Fremont Alliance Church be a church that tells what God has been doing. Because if we think about the hope for the next generation, it is not about Melissa McDonald coming and doing a nice little speech. That doesn't matter. It's about you sitting in your pew going, you know what? I could tell someone my story. I I could smile more. (laughs) I could choose joy instead of anger. That's what passes on faith. And this generation, what they desperately need, I could go into all sorts of more research, but what they desperately need is for us to live real, authentic lives in front of them. Way more than they need us to know all the books of the Bible in order, way more than they need us to quote scripture at them, way more than they need us to go to church every single Sunday, they need us to live authentic lives. And the beautiful thing about authenticity is it's messy. And a lot of times we don't like people to see our mess, but our mess is actually what points people back to Jesus. And it talks about that in 2 Corinthians. It actually says that 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 shows that this power that we have is not from ourselves because it's from God. Have you ever thought to think that your mess may be actually part of God's grand design and purpose? How he can take your mess and use it? That's the redemptive God we serve. That's what I get excited about. I got a lot of mess, and I love that God's like, yes, you are a mess, but (laughs) I'm going to do something. I tell kids all the time, I I just got done speaking at a camp in New York last week, and I said, how many of you feel like you're one big ball of awkward? Well, guess what? They're like, me every day. And if I asked you, probably a lot of you, if you were honest, would be like, yep, totally. (laughs) You know what? That's okay. It's okay. And when we admit that we don't have it all together, guess what? Suddenly we're on a level playing field. Suddenly we're not any better than anyone else. We just know Jesus. And he takes our mess and turns it into a message. Like he takes it and goes, I got something for it. Parents, you are the number one spiritual influencer in your kid's life, like it or not. Adults in the room, that parent you're thinking of right now, that you don't like, (laughs) your neighbor, that person in the grocery store, I don't know who it is, that person is the number one spiritual influencer in their kid's life, whether we like it or not. And we could get really depressed about that, but I really believe that we serve a good God who didn't see that and go, oh no, whoops. 
one of my greatest revelations in the last five years is that God was like, hey, I don't ever say oops. Now, that's not very profound, I'm aware, but I work with kids, okay? So I work at a very easy level here. God didn't say oops and go, oh, I didn't know the world was going to change like this. I didn't know we'd have a, a fatherless generation. But this is where the church gets to step in. But parents, you matter so, 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 so much. I was going to show a video, but I'm running out of time, so I'm going to skip. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's how we communicate back there. Um, church, you have a role in passing on faith. We've talked a little bit about it, but healthy families, and we as a church want to be a healthy family. Am I right? Am I right? Think about a healthy family. Maybe you're in a healthy family. Think about a healthy family that you look at. Every single healthy family is still, still has that weird Uncle Bob, right? Still has that, like, Christmas can be real hard, even in a healthy family. But everybody knows that they belong. Everybody knows that they belong. And I keep saying that over and over, but healthy families are where everyone belongs. And what our world desperately needs, I was asked to preach at a church in California, not an Alliance church, and um, I was driving there, and I was passing church building after church building after church building. And I realized we don't actually here in the U.S. need another church building. We actually need people in the church to start being the church, to stop staying in the building but actually going out, to go and, hey, we're a family, warts and all, mistakes and all. But healthy families are where everyone belongs. I'm going to tell you a couple stories. Skip down just a little bit. Go to Alex. Um, so I was at a camp in Florida last year, and I love, camp is one of my very favorite places to be. Do you know that at camp, most, almost every camp, I get more time with kids in a week than most churches do in a whole year? I love it. I love pastoring these kids. I always do the evangelism message at the very first night, and then I disciple them the rest of the time. Because I'm like, let's get them into Jesus, and then let's make sure they go home loving Jesus and know what to do with Jesus at home. So third or fourth night, <clears throat> I always have a line of kids that want to talk to me. And I get a lot of boys who want to talk. And I don't know what it is about me that boys think she's safe. And so he, this one kid, he wore a coonskin hat the whole, whole time um, in Florida. That thing smelled like a dead coon. It was <laughs> horrid. And so he comes up, and he's sitting next to me, and all of a sudden he just goes, Miss Mel, can I tell you my story? I said, yeah. Kids use that all the time. Do you know, I actually think if we understood the importance of story, we would be quiet a lot more. I think we would listen to people a lot more. So I said, yeah, tell me your story. And, he, and then he starts to cry. And he's right on that edge, right? Like he's just becoming a teenager. So his voice is a little cracky. And yet he's still a little boy. He's like up to my shoulder, so he's tall. And I looked at him and I said, is it OK if I give you a hug? And he said, yes. And I put my, and he just collapsed and started sobbing. Can I just say we need to be hugging kids a little more as well? <laughs> Especially that weird age of kid. Dads, be sure you're hugging your daughters. Moms, be sure you're hugging your sons. So he's collapsed. He goes, my mom and I lived in a, um, in a shelter. And I said, okay. And he goes, we live there because my mom's boyfriend tried to kill her. And he goes, I was in the other room, and I could hear everything, but I couldn't do anything. And he's telling me this whole story, and I'm wrecked, right? Completely wrecked. And he goes, and I couldn't do anything because I was too little, and I couldn't do it. He goes, but I could hear it. He goes, so then we went to a shelter. And he goes, we're doing a lot better now, but nobody knows my story. And I said, what church do you go to? And he told me, and... And I, I said, does anyone at church know your story? And he goes, everybody knows my mom's story, but nobody's heard my story. He goes, everybody takes care of my mom. And I'm so glad. I'm so glad they take care of my mom, but nobody's heard my story. Isn't that interesting? It broke my heart. Actually, it made me real mad. Um, I'm very motivated to anger at times when stuff like that. And so I was about to call that pastor and have a few words, and the Holy Spirit stopped me. But... Um, I said it wouldn't have been of the Lord, but I was like, this is not okay. This is not okay. Well, he was just at camp last month. I saw him again, same coonskin hat. Like, seriously, I'm like, really? That's still on your head? Like, ugh. 
<laughs> He's like, you want to wear it? I'm like, no, no, thanks. <laughs> I don't want lice. <laughs> so I said, how are you, Alex? He goes, you know what, Ms. Mel, I'm actually, I'm better. I'm better. And I had emailed this pastor gently, kindly, and just said, hey, just letting you know. And he goes, my church is listening to me more. And he goes, I feel like I belong there more. Church, that's what we're meant to be, right? That's what we do. And may I encourage you not to overlook the ones who are shorter than you. May, may I encourage you to not overlook those who are younger, the ones who you go, I don't really know if there's a whole lot going on. I guarantee you most kids look like nothing is going on in their heads, but everything is going on. I ask kids all the time, how many of you stay up late at night thinking about God? Everywhere I go, you guys, literally not just in the U.S., around the world, every kid will raise their hand. Do you know that because we were created by God for God, we have an innate desire to know God whether we've ever heard about him or not? And kids lay in bed at night and they wonder about God. Don't underestimate that. This next story, these three boys, and this is, uh, I've got, I just, I'm giving you two really hard stories, but William, Wesley, and Joey, last summer they were at camp and I found out from one of the leaders that they had just lost their mom. And uh, the Wesley and William are twins, and Joey's a few years younger. And they came with their church. They just lost their mom. Well, unfortunately, their dad had chosen to take their mom's life. And then he was in prison. And we spent all last year at camp, Mr. Lou and I, <laughs> spent a lot of no meals just sitting with these boys. And they were 10, and they'd go, why are we crying all the time? I'm like, that's a good thing. That's normal. And they would cry, and we would talk, and they would cry, and we would talk. Here's what the really cool thing was. They went back home to a church who loved them, right where they were at. And they went back to a place where I'm just there for a week. I can't do a lot. Sure, I can do some counseling. I can do some listening. But they went back to a church who enveloped them. And do you know how hard it is to envelop a mess like that? Their parents had been missionaries sent out by that church. Horrific story. Same boys, three boys came back to camp last, last month. And they're like, Miss Mel, we're here. I'm like, great. They're like, we're not crying nearly as much as we did last year. I'm like, that's great. I stayed in the lake with them for I don't even know how long. And they talked to me about trucks, which I got to tell you is probably my least favorite subject on earth. Um, I know that they're big and black is a good color. Like, I don't know anything. And they said, we're doing a lot better. We're doing a lot better. We, we still really miss our mom. And we really don't know what to do with our dad. And Wesley said, I really want to see my dad. And William said, I don't want to see my dad. But they said, our church is loving us. Our church prays for us. Our church is family. That's, that's what we're called to be. These three little boys. Joey had been catatonic the, month, the year before this year. The dude wouldn't stop talking. Like he wouldn't speak at all a year ago. This year I was like, okay, Joey, Miss Mel needs a break. That's what the church does. That's what healthy families do. They don't say, hey, you got to get it all figured out and then we'll take you in. If we really want Christ for the next generation, it's going to take all of us. It really is. It's going to take all of us. And I'm telling you sad stories, and I'm not doing it to manipulate you. I'm not. If I wanted to, I, I could. I have way worse. I could. I could tell you about the girl last week that I had to call DHS on because of abuse going on in her home. And I was the first person she ever told. I could, I could wreck you. That's not my point. My point is when the church operates as a healthy family, guess what happens? People get healthy. People find Jesus. Families change. It's the coolest thing. I'm going to end with um, just a couple things. Can you skip to healthy families allow for questions? This is a big thing. I, I really desire the church to be a place where people can come and ask hard questions. I think too often we're churches where people can come and you need to at least understand or you're not. You're like, we don't want you to ask questions. Part of it is because we're not real sure what the answers are. I had a boy ask me, he goes, Miss Mel, God can't sin, right? And you could tell he was setting me up for something. And I was like, right, right, he can't. He's like, well, then how did he murder everyone with the flood? I'm like, oh, kids are annoying. That's a hard question. 
I don't remember what I said, so I'm sorry I can't give you that answer. But it was divine. I, this is my prayer, and you can use it anytime you need to. Dear God, please give me divine inspiration and wisdom, wisdom or take me now. <laughs> and he's yet to take me. And he's, sometimes I get wisdom, sometimes I don't. But you can use that anytime you want. And then I'm like, Lord, please don't let it traumatize the children. Amen. That's it. But these kids, they ask hard questions. So I want to show you a few questions. This first one says, God, are you real? Are you the type of church community where kids can come and not just kids, adults can come and not be sure about if God is real? Is that allowed here? It should be. Because if we were real honest, we've all had our moments. God, are you real? And teach me how to spell. Um, this next one says, God, I want to know way more about what you did to everything, like how you learned to obey every time and listen. What do you think this kid's struggling with? <laughs> A little disobedience going on. This one says, God, what is the purpose of my life? Kids write all these, I, I no joke, probably have 2,000 notes from kids that they give to God, and then I take them for my own because I love to read through them. But I could probably pull 100 out that ask this question. What's the purpose of my life? God, why am I here? Adults, we're wondering that too. You are not alone. Those little ones around you, they're wondering too. This one says, God, you are so good, but why did you make my life so hard? I will do what you want me to do. Just tell me. Kids probably have the most honest prayers of any of us. And they don't really fluff around with God. They're just like, here's what I need to know. Let me know. Healthy families aren't perfect, but we're honest. And God desires and loves honesty. I tell kids all the time, God cares more about your honesty than he does about the words you use. In fact, when I do the evangelism message, the come to Jesus message, I never actually have them repeat, repeat a prayer after me. I used to do that, and I thought, this, nope. And so I just tell them, you just talk to God. Guess what? Every single one of those kids who talks to God from an honest heart knows Jesus. And actually, they pray better than I do. And they cover the bases better than I would. Because God cares more about our honesty. So just a few more slides here of kids' notes. My dad is away and I miss him. I hope he is okay. Next one says, I will love you even when I'm mad at you. I trust you with everything I have. I can trust that you will take care of it. Smiley face. Just in case God's going to strike me dead, I'm putting a smiley face on. <laughs> Because I said I was mad at God, and I just want to make sure that he knows I still like him. But I love that honesty. God, thank you for helping my family when we were broke and when I got adopted. I could go on and on, and if you want to stay after tonight or today for the, the training, you certainly can. But hear my heart here. Hear God's heart. God desires the next generation to know him so much. You think you want the next generation to know him? You don't even have a single bit of an idea of how badly God wants that. And my prayer is always, God, I know you don't need me, but would you use me? So maybe that needs to be your prayer this morning. God, just use me. Don't be too specific. Just say, God, just use me. And maybe you do need to volunteer for Kids Connect or Awana. Man, I love that he was honest and said, we need a man to step up. Men... Your involvement in kids' ministry is way more important than women. I'm sorry to say this, women. But men, you give kids a direct link to who God is. And that may scare you, and that's okay, because you ain't God. But when they see men in their lives, healthy men, men who are authentic, don't get it right all the time, guess what? They associate that man with who God is. Men, you matter. For so many of our kids, they have no dads. You matter in their lives. Women, we already know we matter, right? Like, we're just awesome. So that's how God made us. We can't help it. But they need mamas. They need healthy mamas. I'm not a mama, but you know what? I probably have about 5,000 kids I've been mama to at some point. With a hug or a prayer or a boo-boo band-aid or whatever. But maybe your prayer this morning just needs to be, God, would you just use me? Not tell God how you want to be used, but just say, God, use me. 
Because I believe God wants to do something in Fremont Alliance. I keep thinking of that passage in Isaiah where, where basically it's saying, look, I'm about to do a new thing. Even now, it springs up. Do you believe God wants to do something new at Fremont Alliance? I do. I love you guys. I've never even been in this church building, but I know so many of you that I love Fremont Alliance. And I've talked to Jamie so many times, I've, and, she's, and she was right there, now it's awkward because I'm staring at an empty spot, but I've talked to Jamie, she's out doing her job. I've talked to Jamie so many times and prayed for you all so many times. I believe God still desires to do something new in you. And my prayer is that it's through this next generation. The church of today is kids, it's teenagers, it's young adults, it's old adults, it's single it's everybody. Kids are not the church of tomorrow. They're the church of today. When they receive Jesus, they get all of him. They don't get an age-appropriate bit. And they get all of the Holy Spirit, not a miniature Holy Spirit. Every bit of him. Don't overlook those that actually may have more to tell us about God than we care to admit. Let me pray for you. Close your eyes. Take just a minute. And would you, in the quiet of your heart, if you're willing and honest enough to pray it, God, will you just use me? Would you just pray that prayer? Father, I thank you for this church community. I thank you that this is a community, that this is a family, that this is not just a building. God, I pray you would use us. I pray you would do what you want to do in us so you can work through us for the sake of the next generation, but God, also for the sake of what you desire to do in us. Kids are just starting, but we are not done yet with our journey with you. So would you use us? In your name I pray, amen.